Hello, I'm Gordon Vetti. 20 years ago, the Air New Zealand DC-10 crash in Antarctica was a defining moment in New Zealand history. But more significantly, it changed the way many of us now think about accident investigation. I was an Air New Zealand senior training and check captain who had flown to Antarctica, but I was unable to get the Air New Zealand chief executive officer, Murray Davis, to budge from the flying in cloud pilot error theory and accept my in-depth scientific case study, which for the first time ever brought into account human factors such as mental set, visual counterfeiting, sector whiteout, and systemic errors such as the unnotified shifting of the destination waypoint, etc. However, he did give his permission for me to testify at the Royal Commission as an individual. He was later very angry about that. In the interest of finding the true cause of the accident, I submitted my case study in evidence to the Royal Commission. Fortunately, Justice Mann accepted my hypothesis and tested it against experts worldwide before using it as the basis for his Erebus report. At 10 minutes to 1 in the afternoon of November the 28th, 1979, Air New Zealand Flight 901 crashed into a mountain in Antarctica. There were no survivors. It was the fourth worst accident in aviation history. Despite a series of disastrous administrative blunders, Air New Zealand insisted the crash was due to pilot error. This is the story of the disaster and the subsequent inquiry. If I had seen Captain Collins that morning, I probably would have just said to him, even in passing, well, Jim, there's been a couple of miles change. It won't make any difference to the flight plan. Nobody knew that there was a 27-mile change. In 14 flights to Antarctica, Air New Zealand had offered passengers from around the world the chance to see the last great frontier. Absolutely fabulous, and I've never seen anything like it in my life. Is it how you expected? It's, be, it's beyond anything I've ever dreamt of. It was a dream experience from the cocktail party comfort of an aircraft dedicated to passenger pleasure. The experience was as intoxicating as the champagne. For the passengers, cocooned in the warmth and comfort of their cabin, seven million square miles of frozen grandeur below them, it'd be difficult to imagine a more ideal way of seeing Antarctica. Does that strike you as a remarkable sequence of errors made by perhaps five different persons in respect to the same subject matter? Yes, sir, it's very disquieting. Oh, it's fantastic. It's better than you expected? <laughs> oh, I don't know what I expected. It's just beautiful. The flights provided a view from a few thousand feet, matching the airline's advertising slogan, nobody does it better. There may have been rumblings about the advisability of such flights, especially from the Americans. But for the day trippers, it was the experience of a lifetime. It was a bit like going to a cocktail party. It ran all day. Oh, it was just fantastic. It really was. Would you go again? Next week, if I could. A week later, there were no spare seats on Flight 901. As well as New Zealanders, there were passengers from America, Japan, Britain, Canada, France, Switzerland, and Australia. Their DC-10 carried a sophisticated navigation computer. What none of them could know that day was that their plane and its pilot had in their own ways been programmed to fly to different destinations. at 8.17 a.m. on Wednesday the 28th November 1979, a DC-10 aircraft operated by Air New Zealand Limited was cleared for takeoff Mangere Airport. It was bound on a sightseeing visit to Antarctica via Auckland Island, the Balleny Islands, Cape 
Hallett and McMurdo Station, intending to return by way of Cape Hallett, Campbell Island, I can see there's still grounds of hope if they came down somewhere, well even on the sea, we're doing our best, there's a Hercules, there are helicopters, another star lifter, uh, but the fact that worries me is that about an hour ago on calculations, the fuel would have run out. The American searchers initially concentrated their efforts close to their McMurdo base. They had little reason to look elsewhere. For one thing, believing that 901 was flying straight along the flat sea ice of McMurdo Sound, the American air controller had invited the DC-10 down to 1,500 feet, close to the established military route. And back in New Zealand, the pilot of an American star lifter, which had been some 50 minutes behind the DC-10, returned to Christchurch Airport. Uh, we followed essentially the same route. We descended below the clouds for our landing in McMurdo, and we hadn't heard from him in some time, and there was getting to be some suspicion that something might have gone wrong. So we, we took a look around as we went in, and we saw nothing. The mistaken belief about the plane's final flight path was in time to become enormously significant, but for the moment it meant that the searching aircraft continued to look in the wrong place. As the hours of negative results dragged on, back in Auckland, Air New Zealand's chief executive, Maury Davis, was losing hope. That the circumstances indicate that any chance that is, is a very, very slim one. And then came the end of any hope at all. scattered, burnt-out wreckage of the Air New Zealand DC-10 had been found on the lower slopes of Mount Erebus, the 13,000-foot active volcano that dominates Antarctica's Ross Island. In Greek mythology, Erebus had been the son of chaos, darkness personified, and the name given to the caverns on the way to hell. It was now to take on a new and equally sinister meaning. And at home, another ancient Greek idea, hubris, the sin of pride was followed by its fall as the boastful billboards nobody does it better vanished air new zealand's maury davis ordered that a file be made of relevant documents and then he ordered that all extraneous matter like duplicates of those documents be put aside by destructive process they went through the company shredder and the man whose job it was to determine the cause of the crash was ron chippendale with a team of snow and mountain experts, the chief inspector of air accidents was going south to the scarred slopes of Mount Erebus. One of the questions with which he would have to deal was, when so many people assumed the DC-10 was flying over the low-level sea ice of McMurdo Sound, why had 901 struck Erebus? As they began the grim job of recovering the 257 bodies, they were also looking for two vital pieces of equipment, the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder. The information sealed in these would answer many questions. Erebus was the second major DC-10 calamity in six months. And while the flight data recorder, if intact, would give technical answers, the voice recorder might indicate what human element had contributed to the crash. The cockpit voice recorder will uh, give us a detail of the conversations held on the flight deck in the last 30 minutes of the flight. And they were intact both the voice and flight data recorders. 
Present at the finding of the recorders had been the company's chief pilot, Captain Ian Gemmell. At the inquiry, Captain Gemmell was closely questioned about his Antarctic activities. Until the information in the recorders could be deciphered and returned to Scott Base, New Zealand's Antarctic research station, the crash seemed incomprehensible. He is present with us, and that what may seem to human wisdom like foolishness is God's wisdom. We may not understand with our minds but we ask for faith provided by his Holy Spirit that we may accept what has been done. The flight data recorder indicates that the aircraft was in a controlled flight prior to impact, and that is uh, what we base our opinion on. So there'd be no technical malfunctions. The DC-10 made a pilot-controlled descent to 3,000 feet, and then on computer track had flown inexplicably straight into the mountain. 13,000 feet ahead. In Auckland, Ron Chippendale checked the audiovisual briefing played to the pilot 19 days before the fatal flight. It clearly set a minimum safe altitude for the area, 16,000 feet. Now approaching Erebus at 16,000 feet, the minimum set to altitude. UBMC, a descent to this minimum altitude up to 50 miles before McMurdo will be found advantageous for viewing. At 1,500 feet, the plane had apparently been flying recklessly low. The chillingly matter-of-fact transcript of the last words spoken on the cockpit voice tape suggested to the accident inspector that there had been increasing alarm on the flight deck just before impact. A ground proximity warning sounded and the captain called for go-round power, but evasive action came too late. It all led to one inevitable conclusion. In my opinion, the probable cause of this accident was the decision of the captain to continue the flight at low level toward an area of poor surface and horizon definition when the crew was not certain of their position and the subsequent inability to detect the rising terrain which intercepted the aircraft's flight path. The finding of pilot error was in total contradiction of Captain Jim Collins' reputation. Equally, almost any other finding was inconsistent with their New Zealand's accident-free record. Though Collins had not flown to Antarctica before, he was one of Air New Zealand's most experienced international pilots. And there the matter might have ended. But for this man, Mr Justice Mahon, he had been called to be a Royal Commission of Inquiry into the Erebus disaster. As the lawyers gathered in Auckland, there were clearly two sides. Air New Zealand and Civil Aviation supported the Chippendale finding of pilot error. Captain Collins' estate and his pilot colleagues did not. The inquiry began on the morning of July the 7th, 1980. It opened with a verdict that had already been reached. The evidence you're about to give to this Royal Commission of Inquiry concerning the DC-10 disaster at Mount Erebus shall be the truth. The, the Chief truth Inspector of Air Accidents, Ron Chippendale. The crew were not monitoring their actual position in relation to the topography adequately. The belief that Captain Collins was being made into the scapegoat moved the dead pilot's friend and colleague, Captain Gordon Vetti, to begin his own investigation. Captain Vetti had piloted one of the earlier sightseeing flights to Antarctica, and he couldn't understand why the crew of 901 had flown straight into the side of Erebus. Gordon Vetti began a study of the visual illusions associated with Antarctic flying. We all believe that there was no problem to separate yourself visually from any terrain using our normal tools of trade, the eyes. What we didn't realise, of course, is that you can have 200 miles of visibility and still fly slap into a mountain. Passenger photographs taken moments before impact showed that visibility was not a problem. They showed gaps in the cloud through which the DC-10 had descended to get down to the best level for sightseeing. Captain Collins was, in fact, invited down to 1,500 feet by the McMurdo air traffic controller, as revealed in the cockpit voice tapes. The crew obviously believed they were flying safely, well clear of high ground. Captain Collins did not know he was flying into Lewis Bay with Erebus ahead. Instead, 
He believed he was flying safely down McMurdo Sound along his plotted course. Gordon Vetti developed a theory which said Captain Collins saw what he expected to see, what he had been mentally programmed to see. This artist's impression demonstrates the view down McMurdo Sound. With a low overcast, as there was that day, this is what Captain Collins would have expected to see. In clear weather, Lewis Bay would show Mount Erebus ahead. But with a low sea fog obscuring the cliffs ahead and cloud down to 2,000 feet, it would give the illusion of an horizon away in the far distance. It would have looked exactly like McMurdo Sound. To Captain Collins, who had no reason to doubt his eyes, the deception was complete. The combination of whiteout and expectation was fatal. Down here, it changes, uh, seems like, in a matter of minutes. The Americans have had to learn the lessons of whiteout and Antarctic weather, sometimes the hard way. In preparing their pilots for the treacherous conditions, they demand extensive pilot training. A couple of seasons down here for the junior people, and at least... Uh, a majority of one season down here for a experienced pilot that's coming in. On the first anniversary of the crash, Mr. Justice Mann went to Antarctica to check for himself, amongst other things, the Vetti evidence on Whiteout. The judge and his party made an approach to Erebus similar to that of 901 exactly a year before. As the helicopter flew towards the point of impact, a series of photographs was taken. Mr. Justice Mann was given the perfect illustration of how the mountain could suddenly disappear on a clear day. The crew said that that is what Captain Collins would have seen uh, as he approached the mountainside. One of the crew had in fact been there on the day in question. He said these conditions are identical. So, what's described as a weather phenomenon is not really so. That weather is quite ordinary in McMurdo. And the result is that you have an ordinary overcast. And if you fly down McMurdo Sound at low altitude, it won't matter. If you fly into Lewis Bay at low altitude, then you are in mortal danger. My hypothesis was later scrutinised by various courts and endorsed by the Privy Council and Judge Green in the USA High Court. It resulted in ICAO, the World Aviation Regulatory Body, changing its accident investigation procedures to include human factors and systemic error and to insist on human factor training for all pilots. Systemic factors are usually a number of small acts, errors or omissions within the total system perhaps very remote in time and place from the accident and perhaps individually innocuous enough, but which, when combined, form a trap that defeats the pilots and the aircraft's detection and defence mechanism, inevitably leading to the crash. In the Erebus disaster, the visual counterfeiting would not have been significant had Air New Zealand not changed the flight coordinates and neglected to tell the air crew, invalidating their careful map preparation for the flight up the 40 mile wide clear sea ice of McMurdo Sound. Those changed coordinates had the effect of placing the DC-10 on a direct line with Mount Erebus. They became an important area of inquiry at the Royal Commission into the accident. In 1977, when the Antarctic flights began, Air New Zealand prepared a flight plan for the DC-10's computers, which took them to an end waypoint above the Williamsfield Ice Runway at McMurdo Station, an approach theoretically straight over the top of Mount Erebus. After the first two flights, that Williamsfield end point was moved slightly to another position at McMurdo Station. The move was very small, and the track still went over the slopes of Erebus. However, Air New Zealand considered the computerised courses were merely a guide to get the pilots into the area. Therefore, in practice, the DC-10s did not fly directly over Erebus. The sightseeing demands of the flights gave the pilots total flexibility. Our, our captain is very keen to see a great deal more down here, as indeed all of us are, I'm sure. So our intention is now to go towards the southwest. What none of the pilots knew 
and what Air New Zealand claimed no one knew until after the crash was that subsequent flights carried a navigation error. In 1978, when the airline fed the Antarctic flight plan into its new ground computer, a mistake was made. While I was typing the information from the Alpha worksheet into the VDU, I inadvertently typed the longitude for McMurdo as 164 degrees 48.0 minutes east, rather than 166 degrees 48.0 minutes east. Chief Navigator Brian Hewitt's typing error was to have, however indirectly, tragic consequences. Initially, the error made the flight plan safer in that the flights were now programmed to fly down the middle of McMurdo Sound, away from the potentially dangerous high ground of Ross Island and Mount Erebus. Well, what physically did you do in your check process? Mr. Hewitt? Just, just read along the line, and read along the line on the Alpha worksheet. Did you, in the navigation section, check actual positions on independent material? I did not. For 14 months, the flights followed the route safely down the Sound, close to the track used by military aircraft. The pilot's briefing confirmed this Air New Zealand approach. It made good sense, and it was never questioned. When I left the briefing, I had a clear understanding that we were flying into the McMurdo area, up the McMurdo Sound, with Ross Island and Mount Erebus well out to our left. If mention had been made that our track passed over Ross Island and Mount Erebus, I would most certainly have questioned it to clarify my own understanding. The McMurdo flight plan might never have been questioned, but for this man, Captain Leslie Simpson. Captain Simpson had attended the same briefing as Captain Collins, and he had been given the same flight plan coordinates. As he neared the end waypoint of his flight, three weeks before the disaster, he noticed that McMurdo was further away from his computerized navigation track than he had expected. I thought it would be wise to let other pilots know it was, in fact, 26 miles across so that they wouldn't be um, possibly as surprised or worried about the accuracy of their computers as had been my first reaction when I saw the, the cross-track display. He mentioned this to the man in charge of the Antarctic briefing, Captain Ross Johnson, who then asked the airline's navigation section to see if there was something wrong. The night before Captain Collins was to fly to his death, he was at home with his daughters, plotting the route he would follow the next day. He showed, he showed both of us, or he showed me anyway, that we, he definitely expected to fly um, down the coast of Victoria Land. And so as you're, as you're flying down the sound, you'd see on the right the dry valleys, and then on the left, um, Ross Island. And I remember him um, plotting things with instruments. That same night, Air New Zealand was changing the flight plan for 901. It was being altered by 27 miles. No one told Captain Collins or his crew. At the briefing 19 days earlier, Jim Collins had been given coordinates to take him down McMurdo Sound. But his plane was now programmed to fly on a collision course with Erebus. Collins, who had plotted his course the night before, had no reason to believe that the route had been changed, nor to doubt the accuracy of the DC-10 computers. Sir, I have tried to explain in my brief that as far as anyone knew to my knowledge, the change was not material. If I had seen Captain Collins that morning, I probably would have just said to him, even in passing. Well, Jim, there's been a couple of miles change. It won't make any difference to the flight plan. Nobody knew that there was a 27 mile change. This is what my brief is all about. Keith Amys of the airline's navigation section was saying they were unaware of the original typing error that had taken the track down McMurdo Sound. In ignorance of that error and believing the route always went over Erebus, they thought they were correcting a minor discrepancy. 
The change was, in fact, 27 miles. Had a cross-check been made of what was appearing in the flight plans that the crews were getting, the error would have been readily appreciated, would it not? Yes, sir. I suggest to you that's a fundamental check which appears to have been overlooked by whoever checked out that inquiry that Mr. Captain Johnson made of the nav section. That's an interpretation, sir. The discrepancy being there, it was accepted as the error that had been reported, the hearsay error that had been reported. Keith Amys argued that Captain Collins should have done what the navigation section had failed to do. Are you not in effect saying, though, that this crew should have checked calculations which had been made by experts in the company's navigation section, rather than a procedural type of check when loading coordinates into the CDU? Sir, aviation is check, cross-check and recheck. We never take anything for granted. Why should an air crew check figures which have been produced for them by expert navigators? Well, sir, <clears throat> it's not so much that they don't trust us. But in aviation, the procedure is to check and cross-check, and this is a cross-check that they can do. The following Impact Erebus video and collage of interviews helps to illustrate in more detail the kinds of lessons the Erebus crash has helped us learn and helps document this piece of history. Four years ago, New Zealand was in a state of shock as we mourned the loss of 257 people in the Erebus disaster. And over that four years, the story of the crash and its causes has bit by bit been put together by inquiries and commissions and appeals. But I think it's fair to say that we might never have known why the crash occurred if it hadn't been for the efforts of our next guest. He's a very experienced DC-10 captain who's received awards for outstanding air navigation and the highest standards of compassion and judgment and airmanship. Throughout the Erebus hearings, he refused to accept some of the shallow and expert guesses about weather conditions in Antarctica and the actions of the air crew aboard flight TE-901. He kept on asking questions, and he read, and he researched, and he pushed until he found the answers. Captain Gordon Betty. Gordon, when, as we began to tease at the awful bits of evidence that there were about Erebus, when did you realize that you, Gordon Betty, had to do something about this? Well, it was really pretty early on, I guess. Uh, it was actually on the flight where the uh, accident occurred. <clears throat> I realised that uh, if Jim Collins, uh, a captain who I'd known for more than 20-odd years, an exceptional pilot in all respects, could have um, been the victim of uh, this terrible crash, then I rationalised that so could I, and so could any of the rest of us. So it was a matter of trying to determine the true cause of this accident. What was, was this Gordon Betty saying that this can't be right? You know, what, what has been advanced so far? Was it just yeah. a niggle? Was it no more than that? Well, it, it was a, a very definite uh, compulsion to, uh, or even revulsion, really, at the, at the philosophy that was being espoused by the company and the department that uh, a captain of uh, Collins's calibre would take a crew and passengers screaming and kicking down through cloud till they smashed into yeah. the side of the mountain. That yeah. just yeah. wasn't on. You see, because what the early thing said was that the <clears throat> cause was known and it was pilot error. What, what did that do to you? Well, uh, that did two things. First of all, it spurred me on to uh, greater efforts to try and research the visual perceptual side of, uh, of the accident. And I realised that my views and those of Mr Chippendale were starting to diverge quite markedly uh, in that he appeared to be paying pretty scant attention to the human factors or ergonomics and in particular the visual aspects. So 
Uh, I went to, to varsity. My two sons, both science graduates, put me onto a reading list and so did the various universities around the world. And um, in a process of sort of uh, working backwards from the accident site, I arrived at uh, a hypothesis on how the accident may have happened. Human perceptual psychology became the enigmatic element in this study. To understand the interface between pilot, machine and environment, Captain Vetti began his investigations at Auckland University's psychology department, where his studies were encouraged and directed by Dr. Barry Kirkwood. So if we put the sun in here then, Barry, what would be... Captain Vetti's findings from his study of the mechanics of sight and of psychological sets is demonstrated here. You'll see a dramatic example of the accepted medical thesis that man, whose actions are 80% controlled by sight, always functions through a combination of the eyes and the brain. With the human eye, believing is seeing. With the camera, seeing is believing. Let's consider this cross-section of the human eye as being a camera with the lens here and a film placed at the back. Light rays from the object would pass through the lens, crossing over and form a distinct but inverted image at the back. Clearly, in this case, seeing would be believing. Let's move inside this camera now with its clear image and reconstruct it as the human eye. First of all, in front of the lens we have the cornea, which we know is less than perfectly transparent. The fluid or vitreous humour through which the light rays travel is also less than transparent and therefore the light rays impinging on the back of the eye are degraded or attenuated. In this process of passing through and penetrating quite deeply into the tissue, they have to pass through the neural wiring for the eye, which is on the side from which the light rays are traveling and other impediment before they finally impinge on the photic cells on the retina of the eye. The neural wiring, which partially blocks the photic cells, distorts the image like a picket fence lying in front of the retina. This further distorts and degrades the original image. As you can see, the image is broken and seriously distorted in the passage of light rays reaching the photic receptors. Now we have to say to ourselves, how do we repair this image and restore it to its original value? To do this, we obviously have to do it with the processes in the higher levels of the brain, which take into account what their expectation of that object really is. It is critically important to understand the final perceptual experience initiated by the stimulus is determined by a complex interplay of processes at the various levels of the peripheral and central nervous systems. The human eye selects out this very narrow band of frequency from within the vast electromagnetic band in picking out the area of visual light rays. At the most fundamental level, stimulus energy at the retina is transduced, that is, changed from light energy to electrical impulses in the neural fibers, encoding the information in the stimulus array, that is, color, size, movement and shape is preserved in the pattern of impulses transmitted to the visual areas of the cortex of the brain. At a higher level, the incoming information is decoded 
and interpreted as a meaningful representation of external events. Interpretation involves those higher mental processes collectively called cognition. In particular, it involves memory and mental set. Perception is a highly synthetic process. Therefore, what we see is far from the exact image of the physical world. Perception is highly variable and often erroneous. We can only perceive what we can conceive. For the same reason you were trapped into believing these cards were the same size, the crew of 901 were trapped into believing the cliffs of Lewis Bay were the cliffs of McMurdo Sound. This was caused in both cases by the lack of intermediate visual texture. The larger card represents Cape Bernacchi, the smaller card Cape Bird. Both objects subtend the same retinal angle presenting an identical image. This deception occurring at the retina was passed to the higher processes of the brain and would have served to reinforce all the other expectations or mental sets. Right up until impact, the crew were reassured by seeing precisely what they expected to see. Some sets can be very difficult to unlock or disqualify. In this Fraser's spiral diagram, we've established a set that makes you believe that all the lines spiral into the center. Even when we break the set by tracing the concentric circles with the pointer and showing the dot gets no closer to the center, you'll still find it difficult to unlock your original set and convince yourself it isn't a spiral. Another powerful mental set relates to what we know and believe about rectangular shapes like windows. Here is Ames trapezoidal window. As it moves, it appears to oscillate, and a wooden rod appears to pass right through the frame. In fact, the window isn't a rectangle at all, but a trapezoid, and it's revolving slowly about a central point. If a playing card is placed on one end of the window, you can see, if you keep your eye fixed on the card, that the window really does rotate. Take your eye away from the card, and your set of the oscillating window recurs. Seeing is a synthetic process, and sometimes highly erroneous. Let's see how the unknown importance of visual texture trapped the crew in polar conditions. Visual texture is vital for perception. The tower here today are reporting the visibility as 40 miles, even though we know it is well in excess of 40 miles. This is because 40 miles is the maximum visibility ever used in aviation. Flight 901 also had a reported visibility of 40 miles in the McMurdo area, and yet they remained calm and unaware right up to impact that they were in fact observing in clear air a 13,000 foot mountain directly in their flight path. Visual texture is vital for perception. The islands, houses and trees and other objects in front of us inform us on color, shape, edge and other physical characteristics. These provide the information necessary to the eye to make judgment of relative size, distance and depth. Non-polar trained pilots normally work in an abundance of such visual texture and can confidently judge distance and depth to within meters. However, they would be unwittingly vulnerable in white surface conditions, particularly under an overcast sky. The cloud base and the sea ice. 
Right. And that means that this distribution of light in this region is uniform. And if you've got a uniform distant, different distribution of light, you just don't see objects. Right, so to you see objects, shadows. And stuff. Yeah, to yeah. see objects, you've got to see edges. Right. And yeah. edges come from differences in brightness in the visual field. So you've actually, in this area, then got a total saturation of light That's rays right. impinging from all directions. That's right. I get you. So a monocolor surface would just, contour would just right. totally disappear. The contour disappears. Believe it or not, you are now looking at a heavily contoured white surface with a reflective sheet above modeling the overcasted Erebus. Because of the saturation of light rays being re-rebounded, all of the shadows have disappeared and with it the last vestige of visual texture. This is whiteout, caused by the albedo light reflected from a high layer of overcast cloud. With the sun at an angle of 38 degrees or less, and is the true whiteout situation as distinct from being in a blizzard or blown snow, which is the normally held misconception of whiteout and the one which was incorrectly used to brief the crew of Flight 901. In the case of true whiteout, the eyes would inevitably misfunction without you being even vaguely aware of it and they would fall to their natural focal length of two to three meters. This situation is known as the Gansfield effect. The so eye. even a huge mountain sitting in here would just suddenly disappear. That's right. Removing the effect of the overcast sky, the visual texture returns immediately even though this is a heavily contoured monocolour white surface. Let's see how the crew of this Flight 901 were trapped. They proceeded up the McMurdo Sound area towards a large layer of cloud over the Ross Island, Scott Bay's McMurdo area. This cloud left most of the rest of the Ross Island shelf free and all of the Victoria Range, Cape Bernacchi, Wilson's Piedmont, etc. in the clear. Collins would have been visually ranging on all of these fixes as he commenced his letdown towards McMurdo Sound. He knew his approach to McMurdo and his clearance in fact allowed him to make a descent under visual flight rules. That is, clear of cloud, knowing that he would have to fly in under the lip of this cloud. Then run back in, in the safety of the clear air beneath the cloud for a visual approach to the McMurdo Sound area. However, because the waypoint was changed without their knowledge, we know that they were actually tracking visually up into Lewis Bay on a collision course with Mount Erebus. The green line represents the expected track into McMurdo Sound. The amber line represents the actual track into Lewis Bay. You will notice the angle shown onto the relative bearing or azimuth of the blue lines exactly match, and so do the angles on the red lines. The red line in McMurdo to Cape Royds closely match the red line to Cape Tennyson in both angle and distance. The blue line to Cape Bernacchi matches the angle onto Cape Bird Cliffs, but you'll notice this blue line is only approximately one third as long. Therefore, visual ranging onto these cliffs was erroneous. But because the cliffs of Cape Bird are only approximately one third as high as those of Cape Bernacchi, they would subtend exactly the same retinal angle and present an almost identical visual image to that expected by the crew. Non-polar trained crews operating in crystal clear air with no intermediate visual texture would inevitably be trapped by this unnotified phenomena of false visual ranging. All of these azimuth lines tie in with the voice recorder for the flight 
and clearly show that the crew and Mulgrew saw almost precisely what they expected to see in the reported cloud and flight conditions. The crew believed they were flying safely down McMurdo Sound, whereas in fact they were tracking into Lewis Bay on a collision course with Erebus. What followed was one of the most bizarre coincidences in aviation history. As Collins commenced his letdown into the large clear area to the north of Ross Island, all the regulatory prerequisites for a safe visual approach appeared to be in place. Collins proceeded into his right-hand turn, at which stage the plane's radar detector, or transponder, was coding, indicating that McMurdo had them on radar. But their textbook avoidance of cloud throughout the letdown was leading them unwittingly into the area below cloud, where their eyes would fail them without them being even vaguely aware of it. The passenger photographs demonstrate that there was at least 40 miles of visibility. The mystery is how the crew didn't see the 12,000 foot mountain in front of them. In the Lewis Bay area, there is normally a two foot deep pool of residual sea fog, which sits clear of the ice cliffs at the base of Mount Erebus. However, on the day of the accident, with the wind prevailing, and supported by wind tunnel tests by Professor Anakawa, the wind back eddy would draw the residual pool of sea fog up against the ice cliffs, ramping them out and forming a long white plateau through and up the ice slopes of Erebus, merging in the far distance with the base of the stratus. This plateau effect was later supported by a movie taken by Captain Foley over the accident site while looking from the wreckage towards the Lewis Bay area. The crew were initially in sector whiteout, that is, only the sector immediately ahead was in whiteout. This is a powerful trap because they would suspect nothing at that stage. They would be reassuring themselves by visual ranging onto the textured cliffs on each side. They would see a distinct horizon ahead, either by the cloud cutting the slopes ahead or by the known psychological effects of fill-in or line joining, or by the gradual shading difference ahead, causing a horizon line by mark band effect. It would be only at the last moment, as the textured cliffs moved out of their vision, that they would experience the full whiteout. Go around the car, please. To expand on the mental sets the crew of 901 were subject to, let's show you again what a mental set is. We induced in you a simple mental set. This young lady can also be observed in this diagram. But now we'll unlock this set by showing you an old lady in the same diagram. We similarly caused you to perceive this skull first by presenting it after the crash sequence. The context set your choice and perception, but also ladies eating at a table can be observed. Let's imagine the brain as a library and show how the memory of earlier experiences shapes perception. Each of these books represents elements that shaped the crew's perception. Sets are established all through life and used to form automatic responses to diverse stimuli. For example, driving from work to home, you drive automatically 
without stopping to recheck any of the road signs. The strength of a set and its resistance to being unlocked is determined by the authority behind the set, the frequency of repetition and the number of people sharing the set. Mental set is the brain's method of establishing a code or shorthand for predictable circumstances. Let's now look at the specific mental sets the crew of 901 were subject to. Briefing is a formal authoritative exercise intentionally used to induce useful mental sets and to allow pre-visualization for any flight route. It is imperative they notify any non-standard procedures required for the crew loop. The crew were briefed for an approach up McMurdo Sound but were not briefed of the master computer change. They were given an incorrect briefing on Whiteout. The correct information was available in the AROA document. Collins and crew believed the visual flight rules had been revised specifically for the Antarctic flights with the increase from 8 kilometers to 20 kilometers. In other words, the set had been consciously corrected by company experts. The set was further reinforced by visual clearance from the tower up McMurdo Sound at 1500 feet. Crew loop is the term given to the psychologically bonded crew trained to operate a large airliner. No one crew member can operate the aircraft alone. Close teamwork is required and their duties overlap and each monitors the others. They communicate by verbal shorthand and body language. Apart from providing early detection of any form of incapacitation, the loop also positively ensures that only standard operating procedures are used. Captain Collins' careful map preparation the night before the flight further reinforced his set for flying up McMurdo Sound, but this was invalidated, without his knowledge, only hours before departure by the unnotified change to the McMurdo Waypoint. The McMurdo set was further reinforced because no message followed this ops flash. The crew would therefore believe that they'd been issued with and loaded the one and only flight plan to the Antarctic held in the company master computer. The unanimity of the three nav systems together with the excellent weather to the north would provide the crew with accurate visual checks of their position and reinforce the set that they were progressing exactly as planned in the briefing. The visual checks over the waypoints check their lines of constant bearing and visual ranging at the waypoints would further reinforce their set. The transponder or radar detector flashing would have indicated that McMurdo Tower had them on radar in the correct position, as would the tower's clearance visual to 1500 feet. The NAV computer, Captain Collins and his crew have all been misprogrammed. They do not realize it, but they are already doomed.
You see, I, what I guess was happening there, am I right, was some kind of loyalty, because one half of you, 33 years with the company, must have said, I'll go with them, I'll believe what they're saying. Well, some, uh, some of the people that I was called upon to oppose were, of course, friends of 30-odd years standing. Um, and they remained enmeshed in the idea that Collins must have been in cloud. Now, I had to prove scientifically to them, and obviously later on with the backing of practical pilots, pilots alike, uh, that they were wrong. And I, I felt that while they were accusing me of disloyalty initially to the company, once uh, they realised that the true cause of the accident, or the hypothesis that I was uh, expounding and was supported by uh, the world's leading scientists, I thought at that stage they would be delighted to find the true cause of the accident and would all get together and, and pick up the bits and, sure. and make it back into the great airline. Well, that's that happened before. now because all those findings have been accepted. Has the other thing happened? Yes, it has. I must say that um, I'm critical only of the uh, management of that time. The new management uh, under Norman Geary are doing a fantastic job. Is Gordon Betty a natural fighter? Well, I'd rather be a lover than a fighter, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I don't really think that I, uh, I go around looking for fights or arguments, and uh, particularly where it obviously meant uh, coming out of my sinecure, if you like, at the, at the top of the pilot seniority list, uh, where, um, you know, I didn't seem to have any enemies anywhere in the world. Oh, well, you were senior yeah. training officer. Right. And all, that's, yeah. why, why is it so difficult, or was it so difficult at that time, for the executive officers with that kind of responsibility and experience to accept <clears throat> responsibility, to accept the possibility of error? Well, I think the Privy Council, you know, in their, in their fairly lengthy submissions uh, or report about page 55 or 6, said and I quote, it is a, uh, a failing of human nature that uh, members of the airline uh, management responsible for flight operations uh, should shrink from acknowledging even to themselves that something that they have done or may not have done may have caused such a horrendous accident. Now, you say that really quite <clears throat> benignly now with hindsight, with compassion. Tell me about then, because here was Gordon Betty having to put his job on the line and yeah. go right out. Well, you know, it, we were definitely polarised and that is something, I guess, which, you know, is a price that I've uh, had to pay much more than the monetary uh, problems, you know, uh, with finding that I couldn't work within that hostile environment and uh, and voluntarily terminating my career with the company with seven years to run as their top pilot. Mm -hmm. uh, with the prospect to look forward to, I had always cherished of having my uh, one or other of my sons come through the airline system eventually and perhaps fly with me. Here today, five years after Erebus, five years of investigation and research and controversy, are uh, the two men whose efforts helped to reveal the true causes of this terrible accident. And Mr. Mann, for you, a long and demanding haul over most of that five years. And I suppose when you began the Royal Commission, you really expected that all that would be required would be to rubber stamp uh, an accident report. Yes, that's what I thought. That's what many people thought. The report was uh, published against the wishes of a lot of people. It was thought uh, incongruous that uh, a statutory officer's opinion should be publicised prior to hearing of a Royal Commission of Inquiry. But uh, putting that on one side, I thought, oh, well, I suppose that's what happened, and uh, it's a question of, in the end, just agreeing with what he said. I presumed that the evidence would support what the Chief Inspector had to say. As the commission went on, and from the days when you sat listening to that evidence, uh, it's been a long and tortuous legal course, taking you all the way to the Privy Council. Now, I believe, in general, there might be a common view that because the Privy Council has rejected your appeal, they in fact rejected your findings. Is that the case? Oh, no, that's not the case at all. They, uh, the tribunal... Uh, took the view that uh, I was correct in uh, my assessment of the cause or causes. I was correct in uh, uh, deciding that it was not a case of pilot error. 
Um, and what they did in effect was that um, they said that although I may have been correct, or indeed uh, was correct, in deciding that numbers of witnesses gave false evidence, nevertheless they took the view that this false evidence was given individually by witnesses and not as the result of some uh, predetermined plan. It's rather as if uh, a group of singers sang as soloists and not as a choir. Gordon Betty, what's the lesson for you after this five years of fighting? Well, I, I think I have been accused of uh, defending Collins in this situation. That really isn't what I set out to do. I set out to find the true cause of the accident, to try and find what could have trapped a pilot of the calibre of Collins and could have trapped any of the rest of us. And uh, that's why I advanced the hypothesis and hoped that it would be validated uh, and in order that it would prevent any further accidents of the same sort occurring. Mm. Judge Mahon, do you think he succeeded? Is it less likely now that this kind of accident will happen again? I think that Gordon succeeded um, to an unprecedented degree. When he gave evidence of the inquiry, he produced written material which demonstrated this flat light phenomenon. He produced from um, overseas uh, a man acknowledged as uh, a world expert in the field who confirmed uh, the existence of this illusion and the what happens. And this, in turn, set me on the track of overseas inquiries which are made in the United States, in uh, Canada, and in England from top class experts. They all confirm what I've been told at the inquiry through Gordon's efforts. And finally I went to Antarctica and there the thesis was again confirmed, especially when I was taken for a flight myself in whiteout conditions and uh, uh, saw uh, with my own eyes um, a flat terrain of snow stretching 40 miles when in fact right in front of us there was a snow ridge several hundred feet high. The ultimate answer I think is that I've had numbers of uh, favourable comments from overseas airlines and other aviation experts about the report but probably the most decisive comment I've received is from an overseas expert in high-speed jet training and jet operations. He said that this report had made the world a safer place to fly in. Well, if that is so, then that is due to the persistence of Gordon Betty and uh, the evidence which he produced, the material which he produced, which directed me and the council that sitting in the commission onto the right path. One of the confusing things to the layman about the Erebus case was that involved in it was a government, one of its departments, and a major state enterprise that's run by government appointees, all of them under scrutiny, all of them with something to say. Did that make it more complex for you? Well, that type of situation always makes an inquiry complex where the inquiry is into some disaster or some scandal involving government agencies. And the procedure which has been adopted on so many occasions by some governments in uh, the United Kingdom in particular, is to set up such an inquiry and then wait and see what the findings are. If the findings are generally in favour of the government, then it warmly supports the uh, report which has been uh, uh, submitted to the Crown. If on the other hand, the findings implicate 
in any material manner some government agencies, then the tendency is for the government of the day to reject the report and say what is wrong. Um, that does not happen in Australia, of course, but um, I'm afraid that in England and in New Zealand, such an approach is in accordance with the hallowed traditions of the Westminster style of government. So anybody entering the process of something like the inquiry into the Erebus case in the future will have to be aware that they're dealing as much with politics as they are with the law. This whole inquiry was overshadowed by politics from start to finish. And I include the Privy Council hearing in that wide ambit. Uh, I was well aware that the findings I proposed to make Actually, they're not finding their opinions, but still, we won't bother about that. That they would be ill-received by the government. I was well aware of that. And uh, I knew before I published my report that uh, I'd be attacked by the government. I should also remember hearing on the radio the day after the report was published a conversation between the Australian radio station and uh, the then Prime Minister, Mr Muldoon, as he then was. And there was an exchange which caused great amusement in our household. The Australian commentator said, uh, he said, Prime Minister, he said, uh, you've attacked this uh, Royal Commissioner, he said, but we understood that when he was appointed that um, he was a distinguished judge. To which Mr Muldoon replied, that is what we thought at the time. And uh, as I say, this occasioned great merriment in our household and among my various friends. Is there, just following on the point you've made about politics and about the kind of leadership that can happen every so often in democracy, is there a way in which, and perhaps it was some solace to you, that the eventual court is public opinion and that when people sense right. that injustice has been done and the truth has not been found yeah. they know and they show it oh yes the uh, the public uh, has always been in my corner and still is they're not interested really in court cases they saw what happened and their views i rather fancy are final gentlemen thank you very much indeed One hundred and fifty-seven lives have been wasted. What must we learn? Two programming errors occurred. Misprogramming of the navigation computer and misprogramming of the crew. The responsibility and research for establishing mental and computer sets is the first link in the chain. And this is where this chain failed. This crew loop worked perfectly, but produced the wrong result because it was misprogrammed. Therefore, proper and informed research into operation specifications is vital. We must ensure the rapid transfer of information between universities and the aviation industry. Besides managerial procedures being improved, the pilot training syllabus should be revised to include study in the psychology of perception and, most importantly, how the pilot interfaces between the environment and the machine. The true cause of accidents must always be exposed. Finally, we must promote flight safety research. The proceeds from the book Impact Erebus are being used to endow a flight safety research fund, funding graduate and postgraduate students and subcommittees in universities throughout the world. From these, a forward-looking ground proximity device and a monitor for inertial navigation computer coordinates have emerged with patents pending. These would have prevented this accident and many others. As a result of the Erebus disaster, both Air New Zealand and New Zealand's Department of Civil Aviation have been subject to a most severe audit in every sense of the word. And under new techniques and management, they've emerged much stronger.
20 years after the Erebus crash, it's been very pleasing to have my hypothesis as to the true cause of the accident vindicated with the acceptance of the Erebus report into the New Zealand Parliament. For me, this has been a long road. Parts of the aviation industry continue to prefer simplistic solutions like pilot error, but I've been heartened by the way most experts worldwide have embraced my systemic error theory and the need to study flight safety enhancement and error tolerant systems, and I've been proud to contribute to that goal myself. I was especially proud to receive my doctorate in engineering from Glasgow University for my work on flight safety enhancement. Today we honour a man of undoubted integrity, a highly trained and gifted pilot with an inquisitive, deductive brain of high intellect. His selfless actions have the respect of us all and he is an outstanding role model for today's graduates. Of all the many awards received, I am sure Captain Vetti will cherish the one named after the captain of the ill-fated DC-10 on Mount Erebus, the Collins Memorial Award. Mr. Vice-Chancellor, for all these reasons and many more, it is with great pleasure that I now ask you to bestow the degree of Doctor of Engineering on Captain Alwyn Gordon Betty. This video presentation, along with the proceeds of my books and lectures, helps to support my Flight Safety Research Trust, which helps fund graduate and postgraduate students worldwide on flight safety related studies right up to doctoral level. It's contributed to various safety seminars and attendances worldwide and to subcommittee work on some of the most prominent aviation safety committees. Networking and researching and developing for such things as a low-cost, multi-purpose seat cushion and smoke hood for escape from aircraft and high-rise buildings, etc. We've been involved with the Sky Car with its low-cost, highly reliable, multi-fuel, low-emission, high-power, lightweight engine. There's also been confidential safety reporting systems, verbal and formal, error-tolerant safety enhancement systems, including synthetic vision, head-up displays, anti-collision, and enhanced ground proximity warning against controlled flight into terrain in the aircraft ultimate defence mechanisms and the development of a virtual reality flight simulator trainer. We hope to gain substantial funding in the future for this unique research fund from airlines, fuel agencies, insurance companies, lotto grants, lectures and donations. If you'd like more information about the work of the Trust or would like to make a tax deductible contribution to its ongoing work, please contact me at the Captain A.G. Vetti Flight Safety Research Trust. Your support will help make flying safer for all of us. <laughs>